Good evening. I think we can do better than that. Good evening. Good evening. Ah, there we go. What a blessing to be here tonight. I thought maybe we would just cancel the message and keep having Daniel and his group sing. I was, uh, I was encouraged. That, that was good. I felt bad for Jordan sitting here. I thought they didn't give him a mic. That's not fair. And then when they said he's a sub, I thought, okay, that makes sense. Uh, but, you know, it was good singing. I'm the lost and found. Somebody will probably go back there tonight looking for two peaches, okay? You're not going to find them. I'm just going to confess before the altar call, okay? Uh, my, my boys came back to our table last night, and there was a nice, neat little box of peaches under our table. They thought that meant they're for us. And uh, so, you know, they worked hard sitting still in church. So two of them each ate a peach, and later on the box was gone. And we're like, you know what? I don't think that was supposed to be under our table. That was somebody else's. So whoever's missing two peaches, I know where they are. Um, my apologies. I can't get them back to you, but I could get you two other ones. So they won't be the lost and found, by the way. So anyways, uh, they were nourished well. So uh, thank you for whoever sacrificed those. Hebrews chapter 12, don't turn there, but it says this. After the faith chapter in Hebrews 11, and by the way, you know what the faith chapter is about? It's not about heroes of faith. It's about the hero of our faith and those who are faithful to the end. Did you know that the first part of Hebrews chapter 11 is filled with people who did all these things and you say, wow, God answered their prayers and all that. That's Wow, it's amazing. And then it comes to close to the end of the chapter. And we need to hear this because today we get, we get on these faith movements where you say anything, we act like God's a vending machine and you, you, know, you put in and push what you want and you get it. And if you have enough faith, you get whatever you want. Listen to this. You come to the end of that faith chapter, towards the end, and it says this. And it lists all these people. Actually, it says, you know, too many that we can't name. And it said others were sawn and sunder, burned at the stake, were drowned at sea, and all these bad things that happened to them. And yet they were heroes of faith, right? Where was their faith? You see, if what these faith movements teach today is right, then they're not heroes of faith. They didn't have enough faith. God didn't save them. No, they are heroes of faith. We come to chapter 12. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, and I think the author of Hebrews is looking back to chapter 11, and all these heroes of faith, those who were faithful to the end and lived a full life, and, and the world will look at them and say, wow, they're blessed, and those who died early in life because they gave their life for the cause of God, all of those are gone and before. He says, wherefore, seeing we also compass about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside the weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with what? Patience. Let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Now, when I think about running, I don't think about patience. If I'm patient, I'll walk. Let us run with patience. But the word patience there means endurance. Let us run with endurance to the end. Because life isn't a sprint. It's a marathon. It's a long-distance run. We can't just be all out for God this week. And then next week, we just kind of, no. Let us run with patience the race set before us. What's interesting is you turn a few more pages in your Bible, and you come to James chapter 1, and he encourages us to endure temptation. And the thing that James says that we're to learn through every temptation, something that every temptation has in common, every trial, you know what it is? It's to bring about patience. In fact, let's, uh, let's hop in there. Let me just read you this, this verse here in James where it talks about this. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations, different types of temptations, okay? Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh what? Patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire or incomplete, lacking nothing. So in everything that you're going through all the difficult trial situation you go through, go through it. 
Be patient, or you're not going to learn what God wanted you to learn through it. So you know what? The trials that you're going through, the difficult things, if we're not patient through it, we're not going to learn what God has for us. And then we've got to go through a hard thing again, another hard thing. And if we're not patient, then we don't learn what God has for us. So really, patience is pretty big. Patience is pretty big. Uh, our family was going through a devotional book quite a few years ago, and uh, it came to a section on patience. And the, so it talked about patience. And then it had this quote at the end, and it went like this. Patience is a virtue. It's a poem, actually. Patience is a virtue. Possess it if you can. Seldom found in women, never found in men. A woman penned that, I'll guarantee you that. Look at the person next to you and say, I'm a very patient person. Okay, let's just do that. If you had to laugh while you said it, you're not a patient person, right? Uh-huh. Open your Bibles to the book of Job. Job is known as the most patient man. In fact, a common description of Job or something that goes along with Job, it talks about the patience of Job. There's somebody that's endured. And I just did a little search here on Job, and this is, this is what it says. The, what does it mean by the patience of Job? It's to have an immense and unyielding degree of patience and conviction, especially in the face of problems or difficulty. A reference to the biblical fig figure Job, whose absolute faith in God remained unshaken despite the numerous afflictions set upon himself, his family, and his estate by Satan. The patience of Job. Tonight, the title of the message No, that's not it. Maybe I'm going the wrong direction. Ah, there we go. Secret to Job's patience. The secret to Job's patience. I think we all agree. Job is known as a man of patience. How did he do it? You can say the right thing, but if you say it in impatience, like you get angry, if you're patient, you can usually you can you don't stay angry, you stay calm. But when you lose your patience, you just blow it. As a husband, as a father, every time I lose my patience, I blow it. And any of you guys identify with me in that? You know, you can you can know, okay, this is wrong, I need to discipline my child in this, or I need to respond in you know, this way or whatever, and then I lose my patience, like ah, then I gotta go back and apologize. Take care of it. I need to be patient. We need patience. How was Job so patient? That's what we're going to look at tonight. The secret to Job's patience. Let's read chapter 1. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. That man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and shunned evil. I would love to be described like that. And you know what? If you are someone who is blameless and upright, you fear God and you shun evil. God's pleased with you, right? Amen? And if God's pleased with you, nothing bad's going to happen to you. Amen? Okay, just seeing if you're listening. Just because a preacher asks for an amen doesn't mean you're supposed to give it. He's blameless He's upright. He shuns evil. Good things are coming, Job. Let's just keep reading. He had seven sons. Three daughters were born to him. His possessions were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, a very large household. So this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. I'm reading from the uh, New King James Version, by the way. And his sons, verse 4, would go and feast in their houses each on his appointed day, would send and invite their sisters and eat and drink with them. So it was when the days of the feasting had run their course that Job would send and sanctify them, and he would rise early in the morning, offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be 
that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job regularly. Verse 6. Now there was a day, and I love this part of this of Job's story, because God just gives us a window into heaven. Okay? Now there was a day when the sons of God, and by sons of God it's meaning angels, when the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. Huh, wonder how that worked. So the angels come to present themselves before God, and here comes Satan. Like, did he bunt, butt to the front of the line and so he can talk first? You know, how, how did that work? I don't know, but that, that's how it worked. Satan comes with them. The Lord said to Satan, God calls him out and says, from where do you come? And Satan answered the Lord and said, verse 7, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking back and forth on it. And by God's response in the next verse, I get the picture that Satan is with some arrogance. Saying, you know, I've been walking around in the earth checking things out. That's like my place down there. And God says this, then the Lord said to Satan, verse 8, have you considered my servant Job, there's none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil. Wow, what a testimony. So Satan answered the Lord and says, does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him and around his household and around all that he has on every side? You've blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. But now, and this is Satan talking to the God of the universe. But now, verse 11, stretch out your hand and touch all that he has and he will surely curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, behold, all that he has is in your power, only do not lay a hand on his person. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Satan is known as the father of lies, and I think maybe refer to him as the father of rebellion. If God says, you can do whatever you want to him, just don't touch him, you think Satan's going to listen to God? Well, let's see. Verse 13, now there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. Verse 14 of Job chapter 1, and a messenger came to Job and said, the oxen were plowing and the donkeys were feeding beside them when the Sabaeans raided them and took them away. Indeed, they have killed the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, the fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another also came in and said, The Chaldeans formed three ba bands, raided the camels and took them away. Yes, and killed the servants with the edge of the sword. And I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, I'm saying, time out. Like Job is like, stop, stop, stop. Bangs his head, wake up here. Okay, start over. Why are you guys here? It's like they've rehearsed this. It's like this is a nightmare, but it's real. While he's still speaking, another one came. This is the fourth one. And he said, your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And suddenly a great wind came from across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house, and it fell on the young people, and they are dead. I alone escaped to tell you. You want to talk about a bad day? Woo! Like he lost everything he had except his wife and his own life, by the way. Then Job arose tore his robe, shaved his head, fell to the ground, and worshipped. He said, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin, nor charge God with wrong. Let's pray. Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I doubt that anyone here has had a day like Job had. 
there may be some who've had a day really close to that. But God, I'm confident that there are numerous people here tonight that are in the midst of a story very similar to Job's. Life is difficult, and it's not fair. They're doing what's right, and they're not reaping for what they're doing is right. God, for every person that's here tonight that connects with Job's story, that life is difficult right now, life is hard, they've got questions, they don't understand why. God, you speak to their hearts tonight. You speak to their hearts. And I pray that you would meet their needs and they would listen and obey your spirit as you speak to them. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. I read this story, I read this first chapter, and I'm like, wow! Like, how could you script it any worse? You know, he's, he's upright, he's, he's faithful, he does what's right, he's blameless, and God's blessed him, and he's so carefully trying to serve God. And then Satan comes along, and what's God do? God says, okay, basically gives him the keys. Do whatever you want to him, but don't touch his body. You know, most people have said, well, you should have just let Satan kill me. I would have been better off. But no, that's not what Job says. Satan has everything taken away from him. And when all of it's taken away, Job's response is he grieves. And by the way, when something difficult comes into your life, don't pull yourself up by your bootstraps and say, I'm all right. No, cry. You with me? If you harden your heart to pain, you're going to harden your heart to a whole lot of other things. Job tore his mantle. He wept. This is not good. It's not like he's saying, well, praise God anyhow. You know, maybe my wife and I will have more kids and we'll buy a few more donkeys and you know, things. No, 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 no. This is difficult. It's time to weep but he can worship in his mourning. And he worshiped. And then he just proclaimed this with his mouth. Naked came I from my mother's womb. Naked am I going to return to, to, to the, the earth. I was born with nothing. I'm rich now, but I'm going to die with nothing no matter what I accumulate along the way. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And in all of this, Job did not sin or charge God foolishly. Wow. He didn't charge God foolishly. How did he do that? How did Job do that? I believe he did that because he understood something. He believed something about God. Job believed. Job believed. I want you to remember three words tonight that Job believed about God. Okay? They all start with C, so I'm going to help you remember these. Job believed that, I'll put it up here in a moment, but right now just stay with me. God was in control, and he gave Job a choice which comes with consequences. God's in control. He's given me a choice, which brings consequences. Pretty simple formula. God is in control. He gives me a choice, which has consequences. God's in control. You believe that tonight? God's in control? God's in control? When it, the world is called, the, you know, the, the, the kingdom of the, like it's the kingdom of the enemy and he, he rules over this world right now. It, it feels that way and Scripture talks about this. And yet, God's in control, amen? You see, when I read this first passage, when Satan comes there and he shows up in his arrogance before God and, and you know, he's strutting around like, you know, I, I've come from checking out the world and there's more with me than with you as far as it goes to people. And God says, well, what, what, what about Job? <laughs> yeah, the only reason he's like that is because you put this hedge about him. Well, what's Satan care about a hedge? Just go in and take, you know, give Job. No, he can't. 
He can't. God's in control. And when, when Joe, I'm sorry, when Satan puts a challenge to God and he says, you know what? If, if you make life difficult, you take that hedge down, he's going to curse you to your face. And what's God say? God is up to a challenge. And unlike you and I, God knows when to take a challenge and when not to. And actually, you know, God can take any challenge. Like, okay, do whatever you want to him, just don't touch him. Whoa! whoa. You know, I wonder what, it, is it really true that each of us have a guardian angel? It, it, let's just have a little fun and think about that, okay? If that's true, do you think that guardian angel started to sweat? Like, you know, you, you just said he can do anything he wants, but what, what's going to go on? Job leaves, I'm sorry, Satan leaves with permission to do whatever he wants to him except touch him. There is no respect in Satan. There is, there is no honor of authority. There is nothing good in the enemy. Do you think he's going to go from the presence of God and honor what God has asked him to do? Come on. That's all he can do. He cannot touch Job because God said you can't. Ah. Wow. God's in control. He gives me a choice which has consequences. God's in control. He's given me a choice which has consequences. Let's say that together. God is in control, gives me a choice which has consequences. Say it again. God is in control. He gives me a choice which has consequences. I'm convinced Job believed that, and that enables him to be patient. So throughout this time, he can be patient because he believes God's in control. And he's given me a choice. And when, when one servant, and two, and then three, and then the fourth one came, and everyone is getting bad news and all the way to the end, what did Job do? I'm a victim. Life is just really bad. There's nothing I can do that. Nah, he had a choice. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He chose. I wonder if you believe that God's in control in your life. I wonder if you have the freedom to choose your response when hard times come. I wonder if you really understand that your choices do have consequences. Let's go to chapter 2. This story isn't done. Chapter 2. Ah, let's hold on. Let's, let's look at the enemy a little bit, okay? We need to understand something here that else that Job knew. And we'll pause in the, in the midst of this story. We're just going to look at the first two chapters of Job and then highlight a couple in the last chapter, verse 42. But let's look at this about the enemy, okay? Since we're talking about the enemy briefly in here, and I've described God, let's just say what, what Job knew about the enemy, okay? He knew that Satan is a deceiver, and here's three words that I want you to remember about the enemy tonight, okay? These are all D's, so this will help you remember this one. Satan's a deceiver who discourages to destroy. That pretty much sums up who he is and what he does. Satan is a deceiver who discourages to destroy. Say that with me. Satan is a deceiver who discourages to destroy. Say it again. Satan is a deceiver who discourages to destroy. Th that's who Satan is. That's really all he is. He is a deceiver. He's the father of lies. Did you know that the only weapon that Satan has against us as the children of God is the lie? Because the truth is he's a defeated foe. Amen? The truth is, we've got victory over the enemy, and he's, he's defeated. Amen? So the only way that he can get to us is if he can get us to agree with him. So he's got to lie to us. And when we agree with the enemy, that's where we open the door, and he's able to do things in our lives. Satan is a deceiver who discourages. You know, sometimes people wonder, you know, how do I know when I'm under conviction when it's God's Spirit speaking to me, and how do I know when it's the enemy? Well, here's how you tell the difference. Satan is a deceiver who discourages. If what's bothering you tonight is only at the end of it is only despair, it's not from God. 
You may be under strong conviction tonight, or you have been in the past, or you will be, you will be in the future. When we're under conviction and it's God's Spirit speaking to us, there's clarity. We know what it's about, and we know what we need to do, and we know that at the end of the response to this conviction from God's Spirit, there's hope, there's light. Amen? When God is convicting us of sin, we know what we got to do. we got to confess, and we know what's going to happen. When we confess, we're going to be forgiven. There's hope. But when Satan is, is at you, and, and Scripture says this, He's an accuser of the, of the brethren. I believe it says it in Revelation chapter 12. It says this, Now has now come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ, for the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused him before God day and night. And I think this window in the book of Job is kind of this window of how, maybe how Satan would come and accuse people before the Lord. But he's called an accuser of the brethren. And so when he throws accusations at you, you're no good and you failed again. And, and there you go again. You're back in the same sin. Or you got angry with your children again. Or you, whatever it may be. When it's despair, when it's discouraging, you don't listen to that. That's the enemy. But if it's conviction and it's something you need to confess, confess. There's light at the end of God convicting. When Satan's accusing, it's only despair. God's not of God who brings despair. Remember that. Satan's a deceiver who discourages to destroy. Scripture says that he's a roaring lion roaming about seeking whom he may devour. He's out to destroy. That's what he wants to do right here in this story. That, so this sums up who Satan is. Three words that describe Satan. I've said he's a deceiver. That's ultimately what he is. But three words, three character traits of him, again, just to make it simple. He is selfish, he's proud, and he's rebellious. He's selfish, he's proud, and he's rebellious. Every sin has one of those three words at its root. Selfish, proud, rebellious. That describes the enemy. He's selfish. Selfishness is the opposite of love. There is no love in the enemy. Selfish, I'm sorry, love describes God. That's who God is. Satan's selfish, exact opposite of love. Satan is proud. Pride is the opposite, it's against truth. Pride is a loss of reality. Reality is what is really is, right? When we're in touch with reality, we know what really is. When we're lifted up in pride, we lose touch with reality. Satan's proud, against truth. And thirdly, he's rebellious, he's against authority. God is the ultimate authority. So three character traits of Satan, he is selfish, proud, rebellious. He's a deceiver who discourages to destroy. When we note the truth that Satan is already a defeated foe, we understand why the number one assignment of the spirits of darkness is to darken the mind, to deceive. Now, I'm getting a little bit into some teaching on spiritual warfare, and we're not going to get further in that tonight. Uh, but we need to understand this about the enemy. John 8, 44, when he, Satan, speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Satan's only weapon tonight against you is a lie. That's why we need to know the truth. That's why we need to agree with the truth. Because if you agree with that deceiver, you give him a foothold, to work in your life. And then you're going to have to come back and say, you know what, this is not true. Whatever it may be, whatever that lie may be, and again, uh, we're not going to go further into this, but I do share this part because we've got, to, we've got to understand that about the enemy. It bothers me how much people walk around scared of the devil. In fact, now there's a reason we should fear him, but not really when we look at who God is. And as a child of God, he's got a hedge about me. And nothing's going to come into my life that's too much. We're, we'll get a little more excited about that later on. It's still soaking in. This is kind of heavy right now. One of the lies, one of the lies that Satan will try to get you to believe is that he has the attributes of God. Ah. There's no evidence in Scripture that Satan can see our heart or hear our thoughts. Some of you might have a little pushback on that. 
Because one of the number one ways that, okay, the number one battleground in spiritual warfare, guess what it is? It's the mind. And we're told in Scripture to take captive our thoughts. So Satan is able somehow to tempt us in our minds, and then we automatically believe that he can just read our minds. But there's nowhere in Scripture says he can. Remember, Satan is a created being. He was created as an angel. He was a beautiful angel, Lucifer, and he, he was in charge of the worship in heaven. And, and there comes a time where he's lifted up and proud, and he says, I want to be like the Most High. And I, I, Isaiah 4, 14 goes on about this. You know, I'm going to be like God, and I'm going to do this, and all these type of things. And he's cast out of heaven. But listen, he does not have the attributes of God. He can't look into your heart and read your heart. He doesn't know your future. He doesn't know the future. And he would have changed up a whole lot of things over the crucifixion time if he knew the future. But he doesn't. Scripture says that the angels are watching and learning what's going to happen, and that Satan's there with them, okay? He's just learning. He doesn't have the attributes of God. Don't be fooled into thinking that. Let's, uh, let's, what are the attributes of God? Three attributes of God here that we need to understand. Satan is not all-knowing. Omniscient. That's only God. Satan's not all-powerful. Omnipotent. That's only God. Satan is not everywhere present. That's only God. Omnipresent. That's only God. See, Satan showed up to present himself there, and then he left. He's not omnipresent like God is, okay? He's not omniscient. He's not omnipotent. He's not omnipresent. He's a fallen angel. We need to understand that. And to me, this story brings this out clearly. Now let's go to chapter 2. Chapter 2, and let's see, uh, see what happens here. Job chapter 2, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And again, this is like it happened in, in chapter 1, but now it's after these things have happened in, in chapter 2, uh, in, happened in chapter 1, they're back. Okay, the angels again present themselves, chapter 2, verse, verse 1. Satan also came to present himself before the Lord, and the Lord said to Satan, from where do you come? So Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking back and forth on it. And I think this time he's probably saying it with a little bit of an attitude. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there's none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man? You know, God's just saying what he told him last time. But then listen. One who fears God shuns evil, and still he holds fast to his integrity, although you incited him, me against him to destroy him without cause. That's kind of puzzling to me. God says, you know, you incited me against him to destroy him without cause. But look at Job. He still maintains his integrity. So Satan answered the Lord and said, skin for skin. Yes, all that a man has, he will give for his life. Stretch forth out his hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will surely curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, behold, he is in your hand, but spare his life. Wow. God, how could you do that to Job? How could you do that? Could it be that God did that so that you and I tonight in 2020 can be reminded that God's in control? Satan's not in control. He cannot do anything more to you than what God allows? Could it be that God allows us to see into this to help us understand that we do have a choice in the midst of our difficult circumstances? We're not victims here tonight. Could it be that God's allowing us this window so that you can relax and Stop trying to figure out, you know, who's behind this? Was that God or is that Satan? You know, is God testing me or is Satan tempting me? You know, where's this trial coming from? You know what? It doesn't really matter. What we're supposed to do is to be patient, endure through it. Because if Satan's after you, God's allowed him to come at you in this way. And this difficult time is not going to be too much. I'll, I'll put up a, a verse for you from 1 Corinthians that will explain that. Let, let's get back to the text here. 
So Satan went, verse 7, Satan went out from the presence of the Lord, struck Job with painful boils from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head, and he took for himself a pot sure which, with which to scrape himself while he sat in the midst of the ashes. I had a boil once. It hurt so bad. I had one boil. He was covered from the crown of his head to the sole of his foot. He scraped himself while he sat in ashes. Then his wife said to him, praise God for a godly wife to encourage you when you are afflicted. And hopefully she didn't come and say, you know, ignorant and unlearned husband, you know. That was good last night. Then his wife said to him, do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. The person closest to Job says, just curse God and die. Oh, I love you too, honey. You, you, whew, you look terrible. Life's just bad. Just curse God and die. Now, here's the strong one, right? Now, say, I'm, I'm sorry, Job is to be the leader, and he is. But while he's being afflicted in, in grief, his wife is healthy. Surely she can say, honey, it's okay, I'm, I'm with you. No, no, she said, just curse God and die, honey. Wow. And look at Job's response. Look at Job's response. He says this, but he said to her, you speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God? Shall we not also accept adversity? That's kind of foreign to a lot of us Christians today. We think that God is a good God, and he's supposed to give us good all the time. And if anything bad happens to us, it's like, where is God? How can God be good when my child gets sick? How can God be good when I lose my job? How can God be good when, how can God be good? How many times in the church do we hear Christians who have been raised on the Word of God question the very character of God because of one difficult circumstance. Come on. You know, it's easy just to say, you know, how can God be good when this happens to us? Wow. we got to look at what Job. Wow. Shall we not accept good? If we accept good at the hand of God, can we accept adversity? In all of this, Job did not sin with his lips. There we see it again. Now when Job's three friends, verse 11, heard of all this adversity that had come upon him, each one came from his own place, and he gets the three men who are there coming. They made an appointment together to come. They're going to mourn with him. They're going to comfort him. Great, you're grateful for friends like this. Verse 12, and when they raised their eyes from afar and did not recognize him, they lifted up their voices and wept, and each one tore his robe and sprinkled dust on his head toward heaven. So they sat down with him on the ground seven days and seven nights, and no one spoke a word for him, for they saw that his grief was so great. Job wasn't in here singing, blessed be the name of the Lord, everything's good. No. He is in such adversity, but he will not charge God foolishly. He will not curse God. He will not sin with his lips. Job's response, shall we not, shall we receive good at the hand of God? Shall we not receive evil? Why? How can he say this? How can he say this? Because Job firmly believes God's in control. He gives me a choice which comes with consequences. God's in control. He gives me a choice which comes with consequences. And Job chose not to sin against God with his lips. He chose not to curse God. He chose to keep his integrity. Wow. Job chose not to listen to the foolish advice of his wife. Unfortunately, what happens today in, in many of our lives is when we get a bad circumstance, we resist the devil. Now, I, I, again, this, this gets into some teaching on spiritual warfare, and I, I do want to give you this little bit because too much of our teaching on spiritual warfare champions the enemy and then has us 
believing that there's a demon behind every bush, and every time something bad happens, you rebuke the devil. But did you know that the weapon you're to use when you have a bad circumstance is the weapon of rejoicing? Paul and Silas used it in the prison, and it worked. You see, Paul himself said, in everything give thanks. Why? Because it's the will of God. These guys got it. It's the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning who? You believe that? You believe that? So when a bad circumstance comes, stop rebuking the devil. Say, God, I'm going to praise you anyhow. I'm going to praise you anyhow. Now, there is a time to rebuke the devil. That's one of the five weapons is a weapon of resisting. When you have a direct attack from the enemy, yes, resist him. And maybe there's a bad circumstance. You said, I'm not sure if the devil's behind this or not. I'm going to praise God. I'm going to rebuke the devil. And if the bad circumstance is still there, I'm just going to praise him. So I'm, I'm driving home tonight. Let's say I'm driving home tonight. I plan to. And I get a flat tire. I hope I don't. But if I do, I'm not going to get out and rebuke the devil. Okay? Now, if I have this feeling in my heart that Satan's trying to do something against me, then I probably will rebuke the devil. But then I'm going to continue on and change the tire and I'll rejoice. Too often, we think we just resist, 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 and we still have the bad circumstance. Satan's not, or Job's not resisting. He's blessing God. Your weapon in bad circumstance is rejoice. That's what happens here. Let's continue in this. Our weapon is the weapon of, of rejoicing. Once again, as Satan went from the presence of God, what did he do to Job? He did everything God gave him permission to do. You can do anything you want to him, but don't take his life. What did Satan do? He did everything but take his life. He's, he's a rebellious, selfish, proud Fallen angel. There's nothing good in him. There's nothing respectful in him. And what's he do? He honors exactly what God says he can do. Why? Because God's in control. And God says, you're not going to do anything more than this. And what's Satan do? He honors what God says in this. Brothers and sisters, here's a verse that you need to know. Now, we'll bring it, we'll bring it up here right away. But let's say this again. God is in control. Say it with me. God is in control. He gives me a choice which has consequences. Your choices have consequences. When you choose to agree with Satan, there's consequences. But if you choose to do what's right, there's consequences. Our choices always bring about consequences. You know why the world is in such a mess today? Because God has given us all a choice. We're like, oh, bummer. God, why didn't you just make it so that we can't sin? Okay, that would have meant that he would have to create us as robots, Right? If he takes away choice, then we're like robots. But Revelation 4.11 says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory, honor, and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure we are and were created. Well, if we're created for the glory of God, but we have no choice, we can't choose to worship him, we're just robots, we're not going to bring him glory. So God makes us as people of choice. And when we choose to worship, it brings him glory. When we choose to repent, God gets glory. When we choose to disobey, there are consequences. Don't blame the consequences of sin on God. God is still in control. And in the end, he's going to wrap things up on this earth the way he plans to. God's in control. But God has given us a choice. And our, our, for some reason, our world don't get, doesn't get that, and often many in the church don't get that. Well, how can God be good when we have all this famine and all these wars and all these kind of things? You know why? Our world's a bad place because people continually choose to disobey God. We choose to agree with the enemy. And what's that bring? That brings death. That brings separation. That brings all sorts of, of destruction. But when a life that's been devastated by sin chooses to repent, chooses to cry out for the grace of God, their sins are covered, and then the, the choices from those consequences come good things, and God can work miracles in our lives, praise God, when we choose what's right. But if we choose 
against God's word. We choose against truth. There's consequences. Don't blame your consequences on God. Here's the verse we got to get. There has no temptation taken you but such as is common to man, but God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Wow. Well, you you got to know that one. I memorized that, and I need that one. There has no, say it together, there has no temptation taken you but such as is common to man, but God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. That's the God we serve. No wonder Job could hang in there because God knew how much he could take. No wonder he allowed Satan to entice him to him and not his wife because she would have cursed God right away. God knows what you can handle. What you are going through tonight, brother and sister, is not too much. Huh? The difficulty that you're in right now it's not too much. But is God just trying me or is Satan just out to get me? Time out. God's in control. God's in control. And what you and I have got to do in the difficult times is choose patience, choose to rejoice, choose to believe. God, you're in control. I can choose to do right. I can choose to bless your name. We don't have to walk around fearful of what Satan's going to do to us because God's still on the throne. And Satan cannot do anything unless God allows him to do it. And God is a loving Heavenly Father who will only allow what we can handle and what we need to bring us closer to Him. Can you think back in your life to a difficult time that you went through? And at the time, it was very painful. It was very difficult. But after you were through it, maybe it took a month, maybe it took a year, maybe it took five years, you were closer to God. Can any of you think of a situation like that in your life? Let me see your hand. Wow. That's how God works. That's how God works. He loves us so much that He wants to grow us deeper with Him. And so he allows those difficult times to come because I'm going to grow you. We, we look at uh, one of the brothers had a, a devotion from John 15 about abiding. Talks about abiding. And guess what happens to the vine that bears much fruit? Guess what, guess what he does to it? He prunes it. Oh! He prunes the one that bears much fruit. You know what happens when you prune something? My dad knows how to prune things. And when I watched him prune the grapevine, when I watched him prune the apple tree, like he just hacked it down. And I'm like, Dad, we don't need that much firewood. We we, we want apples next year. Hold on. But my dad knew that a well-trimmed apple tree, a well-pruned grapevine is going to bear more fruit. And how are we any different? And then what do you, what's John tell us to do in John chapter 15? We're not commanded to bear fruit. Do you know that? Turn to the person next to you and say, we are not told to bear fruit. We're told to abide. Are you with me? You know what's unfortunate today? Is what we see in each other's lives is the fruit. And too often, we get distracted by fruit. And we start seeking for ways to make more fruit. And we stop abiding. Abide, then you'll bring forth fruit. Abide, then I'm going to prune you. And then I'm going to, you're going to bear more fruit. I wonder where you're at tonight. I wonder if you believe, like Job, God's in control, and he gives me a choice, which brings consequences. Satan is just a deceiver who discourages to destroy, 
And I'm not going to listen to him. I'm not going to agree with him. I'm not going to focus on him. I'm going to focus on God. Oh, yes, if the enemy attacks me, I'll rebuke him. But I'm going to focus on God. And when bad circumstances come, I'm going to praise God anyway because God's in control. The end of Job. We've got to look at this before we bring this to a close. The end of Job. If you were to go to Job chapter 42. Now, Job had some things to learn, and he did. But we come to the end of this. And in Job chapter 42, it says this, And the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. I find that interesting. When he prayed for his friends, turned the captivity around, and also the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. The, and then it lists them. He had 7,000 sheep in Job chapter 1. He's got 14,000 now in Job chapter 42. He had 3,000 camels. The text has it right there, 6,000 camels. It was 500 yoke of oxen. Now it's 1,000. You know, 500 donkeys. Now it's 1,000. And he's got seven sons again and three daughters again. God blessed the latter end, and I think God does that just to show that, you know what, God is merciful. God wasn't out to make it difficult for Job. God wasn't saying, you know what, I'm just going to use you as an example for all, all of eternity, and it, it's just going to be tough. In the end, God says, you know what, I'm just going to give it back to you. I'm going to bless you, and God can do that, and God might do that to you, and he might not, but that's okay because he's God. God is a good God. He's in control. Can you trust him? Can you trust him? I wonder tonight if you're here and you're questioning God's character because your circumstances aren't lining up with how you thought it should be. I wonder if you're here tonight and you've gotten into this, this uh, prosperity gospel where I, you know, I pray to God and he gives me anything I want. You know, Scripture does say we ask in the name of Jesus, we're going to get it, but we are to ask it for what? For the glory of God. There's conditions on that. Are you here tonight, and you're viewing yourself as a victim of your circumstances? You're not choosing well, and it's not your fault because you're a victim. It's because of what your dad did to you. It's because of what the economy has done. It's because of our country. It's because of the pain. It's because of that drunk driver. It's because of whatever it may be. It's because of that person that got you into pornography. It's because of them. You're just a victim. Brothers and sisters, no one here is a victim tonight. You have a choice. And tonight, if it's sin that you're entangled in, you have a choice. You can come to the altar and you can say, God, I need your grace. I need your mercy. Forgive me. If you're here tonight and you're saying, life is hard, I don't like where life is right now, I don't like my life, if that's where you're at tonight, you can choose to say, God, blessed be your name. I'm going to praise you in this desert. I'm going to praise you in the valley. And even if you don't bring me out of it till the end, I'm going to praise you anyhow because you're God and I'm not. God, you're in control. I have a choice. I'm going to choose to honor you. I don't know where you're at tonight. I don't know. But Job said this, blessed be your name. When the sun's shining down on me, when the world's all as it can be, blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when it's a dry and barren land, when I'm found in a desert place. Blessed be your name. Are you tonight able to choose to bless the name of God in spite of your difficult circumstances? If you aren't, I think tonight you just come and confess that. I'm sorry, God. I'm doubting your character. I'm not rejoicing in difficult circumstances. God, you're in control. Satan doesn't have the power you do. He is not all-knowing. He's not all-powerful. He's not omnipresent. God, I'm going to fear you. I'm going to honor you no matter what. Let's pray. Father, come to the name of Jesus. You look into our hearts tonight, God. Speak to our hearts. For the one here tonight, that their life feels like a wreck, God, it's not out of your control. 
I'm confident. I pray you would speak that to them. And I pray tonight they could choose to bless your name. They could choose to rejoice. Father, to the one here that's entangled in sin, and they're not living free. Their sins aren't under the blood, as, as our, our brothers and sisters sang about earlier tonight. They're living in bondage. Father, I pray tonight they could choose to confess and that the consequences of a life of sin would not continue to rule over them, but they would choose to repent. God, we're, we're, you've given us people of choice. May we believe that tonight. Father, whatever the difficulty may be tonight, whatever the case may be in the hearts, Father, may we choose like Job to believe you're in control. You've given me a choice, which brings consequences, that we may be people who have patience, who have endurance. We go to the end. Speak to us hearts. Speak to our hearts, God. Speak to our hearts for your glory, I pray in Jesus' name.